Hi, this is Lynn Liaz, and I have with me tonight Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat. And in our last program, we talked about Purim, and we talked about the Scroll of Esther. And we've got some very interesting things to talk about that we didn't get to share in the last program. So Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat is here with me. And Zev, I just want to thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's always a pleasure to have you and my listeners love it when I have you on. In fact, they email me all the time asking me when you're coming back. So thank you so much for, for coming on tonight with me. Well, thank you, Lynn, for having me. It's always a blessing and an honor. Well, and the same to you always. So we're going to be talking about the prophetic meaning of Esther for the believer, the body of Yeshua, because Esther paints a prophetic picture of victory for the believers. Now, Real quick, those of you listening out there, I encourage you to grab a notebook and a pen or a pencil and take notes because Rabbi Zev is going to be mentioning quite a few Bible verses and we're not going to have time for him to quote each verse. So he's going to mention the verse so that you can go and look it up for yourself later. So be sure and grab a notebook and a pen and take some notes. So Rabbi Zev, my first question for you is we're talking about, you know, the prophetic implications of the scroll of Esther here. So I have a a very important question to ask you. Esther is the only book in the Bible that does not have God's name in it. And I just want you to explain to me and, of course, to the listeners why that is and how can it be prophetic if God's name is not in it? Well, the book of Esther, very good question. The book of Esther doesn't have God's name written in it, but God's fingerprints are all over the book of Esther. And we mentioned that it's prophetic pictures for the believers, the body of Jesus, Yeshua, uh, spiritually Israel, grafted into the olive tree. And only through the Holy Spirit can we see God's fingerprints. That's one of the reasons, for example, uh, the Jews celebrate, uh, the non-believers celebrate the, the Purim, which is uh, the, from the book of Esther. But they only see the surface of it, the victory of the Jews, defeating Haman, which is all true. But without Jesus, without Yeshua, without the Holy Spirit, you can't see the prophetic picture. And to fully understand the prophetic picture, we have to go, first of all, to understand what does the book of Esther mean. Now, in Hebrew, it doesn't say the book of Esther. It actually says the scroll of Esther. And I've seen some translations in English that also say scroll. When you understand what the word scroll means in Hebrew, you begin to understand the prophetic meaning of the book of Esther, the scroll of Esther. The word for scroll in Hebrew is the word Megillah, and that's why it's called Megillat Esther, the scroll of Esther. Now, the word scroll actually means reveal, revelation. So we see that it's the revelation of Esther. It's not the book of Esther. It's the scroll means revelation. And in fact, the word Esther comes from the root word Hebrew, lehastil, which means hidden or concealed. So Esther's name means hidden, and the scroll of Esther means reveal or revelation. We think about the book of Hidgalut, the book of Revelation. We go to uh, Revelation 111, write these things on the what? On the scroll, on the Megillah. So the book of Revelation is, is the mystery revealed. We think about the book of Daniel. Daniel 12, 4, what did God tell Daniel? He said, do not seal up the, some say seal, but in Hebrew it says, do not seal up the Megillah, do not seal up the scroll, for the mystery of the end time is not yet revealed. So we see that the revelation of the end time, as we get closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus, Yeshua, that mystery that Daniel spoke about is being revealed to us and part of that mystery is implanted in the scroll of Esther when we understand the prophetic picture that it's not just the victory of the Jews on Haman but it's the victory of all believers in Jesus on Amalek because Haman was an Amalek and that's the prophetic picture when we begin to understand the story of Esther and what it means to us prophetically. Very interesting. And I was so interested in your previous message you gave about Esther. And of course, there were some some really interesting prophetic subjects you mentioned that I wasn't completely aware of that I was just amazed by. And I'm really excited to hear all the other information that you're going to be sharing 
in this discussion about the prophetic picture of Esther for the believers, especially with it being a uh, Purim right now. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we need to, to look at the story of Esther and realize that there's a number of important duplications in the book of Esther. And these duplications actually show us that what was will happen again, and it's a foreshadow of our victory through Yeshua. And I want to go through some of these duplications. If we look at the book of Esther, first of all, some of uh, one of the very important things I want to mention is that in the book of Esther, the duplications actually are a foreshadow. And let's have a look at some of some examples of these duplications. There were two lists of kings and servants. The first list is found in Esther 1.10. The second list is found in Esther 1.14. So we see these lists and names are two times. We also see two reports of Esther's hidden identity. We know that she was told not to reveal her identity. The first hidden identity is found in the book of Esther, chapter 2, verse 10. Esther did not make known to her people her heritage because Mordecai had instructed her not to make known. And again, in Esther 2.20, Esther did not declare her heritage. So we're going to see all through the book of Esther, duplets, duplets, duplications, all through the book of Esther. It's very important to realize that because God is speaking to us that everything that was will happen again. It's prophetic. Esther 2.19, it says that there were, there were virgins gather, gathered. Esther 5.2, when he saw, we see it again, the duplications. We see again that there are two unscheduled appearances before the king that Esther had two unscheduled appearances the first scheduled appearance was unscheduled appearance was Esther 5 2 when he saw Queen Esther standing in the court he was pleased with her and he held out the golden scepter okay so if we know anything about the time of the king and everything if she was to go to the king with an unscheduled appearance she would be put to death. It was very, very dangerous, but she was pleased because God sent her, okay? So we see the number of duplications. In the same way, we live in the world, but God sends us into the world. We're in the world. We're not of the world, and God protects us. He puts his anointing on us, and that's why the Bible says, Jesus said, greater is he that lives in us than the one in the world. In the same way, prophetically, although she had an unscheduled appointment to go to the king and she could have died because anyone who went to the king without an unscheduled appointment would die. Not only did she not die, but he was pleased with her. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, God's name is working actively behind the scenes. As I said, God's fingerprints are all over the story of Esther. In Esther 8, verse uh, 3 and 4, we see then Esther spoke to the king again. And he fell to his feet. She wept and pled with him for mercy. Okay, so we know that this is when um, she went to the king and asked him to save the people. Again, she went without permission to the king. Okay, so we see this all over the prom. The king extended his hand, a golden scepter, once again to Esther, the second time. So many duplications. Twice we see in the book of Esther, in the scroll of Esther, that Haman. Haman, uh, his head was covered. Okay, the first time we see in Esther 6, 12 and 13. And the second time we see this in the book of Esther 9 and 10, where it says the 10 sons of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, his head was covered. Okay, that's, that you'll find in Esther 9, 10. So it's very important to realize that these duplications are actually pointing to the second coming of Yeshua HaMashiach and are showing us that we have victory through Yeshua HaMashiach even when the world system says no, God says yes, I will deliver you, I will enable you to be a light wherever you are, wherever I have positioned you to be. That is so important. There are so many people right now out there listening and there are people who aren't listening right now who are just under the most powerful evil attack straight from hell and they just feel like they're worthless they feel beat up and knocked down and their light has been snuffed out by the enemy and i just want to encourage those people out there that you have the victory through jesus christ through 
the Holy Spirit to use that authority that God has given you through the Holy Spirit to tell the devil no, that you're not going to listen to him and to rebuke him and to just take God's word and get it in your heart and to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Even if you don't see it, even if you don't feel it, you have to oftentimes ignore what you're feeling and speak faith over your situation and just trust in the Lord because the battle is going to get really, really ugly. And we really need to learn how to put on our spiritual armor and we need to learn how to allow the Lord to fight our battles for us and to stand up and be firm and be strong. And that is just really powerful, Zev, because so many people don't realize what a light they are in the darkness to the world and what a powerful light they can be to the darkness. And they're just laying down and allowing the enemy Satan to walk all over them. That's so true. And the king or the prince of this dark world is Satan. We know that. And he says, you're dead. But God says, I will enable you not only to live, but to carry the torch, to carry the message. That's what he did with Esther. Esther was supposed to, under under the, the law of the king, to die if she goes to the king without being invited. But she went with the power of the Holy Spirit. She went with God's fingerprints all over through the book of Esther. And therefore, not only did the king not kill Esther, but he was pleased. What made him pleased? It was the hand of God working behind the scenes over here. The message is that although Satan says, you can't do it, you're not unable to do it, I'm going to kill you, God says he's going to enable you. We can do all things through Jesus, through Yeshua HaMashiach. That's the prophetic picture here. It's not just the victory of the Jewish people. It's our victory through Jesus, through Yeshua for eternity. Amen. And God wants all of you out there to know that you do have the victory in Jesus, Yeshua. He has given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and the authority to overcome all the powers of the enemy. How do I know? Because his word says so, and that is his promise. But too many of us are just laying down, giving up, speaking doubt and unbelief and hopelessness over our lives. And it's time for us to stand up and stand firm and be strong and to use the power of God's word that he has given us. That's what Jesus did. You know, when, when Satan came and, and tried to tempt Jesus, Jesus used the word of God against the devil. So that's what we need to do. That was an example to us of what we should do. And we've got to just put on the armor every day. First thing in the morning when we first wake up, put on the armor of God, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, so that we can go throughout our day and we can just not allow any of the arrows that the devil you know, throws at us to break us. We have to just let those arrows bounce off of us. And the only way we're going to do that is to stand firm and have the spiritual armor that God has given us put all over us from head to toe. Amen. Amen. If we look at Esther chapter one, verse two, it says that the king Asarius was in Shushan. Where is Shushan? It is Iran. Now we go to the book of Daniel. Very, very prophetic here in the book of Daniel. It says that where was Daniel? If we look at the book of uh, Daniel, it says that Daniel was in the palace in Shushan. So we see that Daniel was in the same place that Esther was. And what's the story of, of Esther? The story of Esther is a madman from Iran that wants to destroy the Jewish people, wants to destroy Israel. Today we have a madman in Iran that wants to destroy the Jewish people. Everything that was will happen again. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, there is nothing new under the sun. That's the reason it's so important to look at these duplications, because God is speaking to us that everything that was will happen again. And in fact, uh, we need to first realize who Haman was. Who was Haman? Haman was a Agatite, Agakite, and Agakite was an Amalek. Now, who was Amalek? Amalek was the grandson of Esau. Now, who was the grandson of Jacob. At the same time that the grandson of Esau was alive, which is Amalek, the same time the grandson of Jacob was alive. Who's the grandson of Jacob? 
the grandson of Jacob, was Peretz. And from the line of Peretz comes Messiah Yeshua. So we see here that it's much deeper than just the story of Esther here. We see here that it is a spiritual warfare between the grandson of Esau, which is Amalek, which is an antichrist spirit operating through Satan. We understand that against Jacob, which is Israel, with the grandson Peretz, which from the line of Peretz comes Messiah Yeshua, Mashiach Yeshua. So the war is between God's people and Amalek. And that's the prophetic picture here. So we need to understand who Haman is, what his background is, to fully understand that the war is not just in the story of Esther, but the war is against the body of Yeshua, Mashiach, spiritually Israel. Esau's grandson against Jacob's grandson. Amen. And that war is still very much going on today. And not just between the uh, Muslims and the Jews, but the spiritual war that you're talking about between the powers of hell and the people, the body of Christ or the people who follow Yeshua, Jesus. And that war is very, very real. And we need to know who we're up against. And we need to know not only that, that greater is he that is in you, the spirit of Yeshua, the Holy Spirit, than he that is in this world. And if you remember that and remember that you have the power and the authority through Yeshua, Jesus, that you can conquer all of these mountains. You don't have to let the devil or the powers of hell trample all over you and your family. And that's one thing in particular that's going on today is the enemy Satan is destroying the family and he's destroying the body of Christ through the family and the body of Christ is in a place right now, very dangerous time where they have just fallen away a lot of them and, and they need to repent and come back to Yeshua. And now is the time because so many prophetic things are happening, Zev. It's just unreal the way things are unfolding and that we can see how close to the end that we are and the body of Christ is not ready there needs to be a great move of the Holy Spirit and people need to repent, which means change of mind, change of heart, turn back to God before it's too late. Amen. And although sometimes people feel discouraged and they see they don't they don't see God's hand in their life, or they don't feel God's hand in their life. God has never forsaken you. Just like in the story of Esther, we don't read God's name, but God's fingerprints are all over the book of Esther. In fact, I want to show you something very prophetic, Amalek. We're speaking about Amalek, that Haman was an Amalek. That's the war. The war is against Amalek and the body of Jesus, the body of Yeshua HaMashiach, the believers. That's the prophetic war here. But when is Amalek uh, first mentioned in the Bible? Well, we know, first of all, that Amalek was the attacked Israel when they were freed from bondage in the desert, in the wilderness. And God said that I will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So God already told us Amalek's coming. Every generation, there's going to be an Amalek. And that's what we see from Esther, from the time of Genesis. We see all this. But when was Amalek mentioned first time in the Bible? Well, first time that we see the word Amalek in the Bible is in the book of Genesis, Genesis Bereshit, Bereshit, 14, verse 7. And it says that they conquered the country of the Amaleks or the land of the Amaleks. But in Hebrew, it says they can't, they conquered the territory of the Amaleks. Now, what's the difference? In Hebrew, the word territory doesn't necessarily mean a country. If I tell you that I've conquered the country of the Amaleks, it seems to, to read into the text that the Amaleks already were in the country. That's not what the Hebrew implies. It's a, it's a prophetic foreshadow of the future, meaning in Genesis 14, 7, Amalek was not born yet. What is he saying? He's saying, God is saying that Amalek is going to be in this area, but you've already conquered it. The land, yes, you've conquered this land where he's going to be. He's never going to own this land. That's for sure what it means. But it also means that you have victory over Amalek even before he was born. As the, as the Bible says that I've written your names in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. Okay, it's the same thing here. He's already foretold before Amalek was born, that Amalek's going to be defeated. Not only is he going to be defeated, but he's never going to own the land because Israel, Genesis, has already conquered the land where he will 
prophetically try to rule. Now, where do we see Amalek mentioned born in, in the Bible? In Genesis chapter 36, verse 12, Amalek is born. So Genesis 14, 7, Amalek is mentioned before he's born. But Genesis 36, verse 12, Amalek is born. Now, what's prophetic here? From Genesis 14, 7 to Genesis 36, 12, there are 12,110 Hebrew letters. What's amazing is in the book and the scroll of Esther, there are 12,110 letters. You tell me that's not prophetic. God's fingerprints are all over. He's telling you, I am going to defeat every single Amalek in your life. Amen. That gives me goosebumps. And I loved what you said, too, when you said how God's fingerprints are all over it, yet you don't see his name and how that is true in many of our lives where we don't necessarily feel God or see God and we think that we've been abandoned by God but yet he is ever present in our life holding us and you know something came to my mind Zev if, as you were talking if you don't mind me saying and that is I just want to tell everyone out there listening those of you who are feeling really just defeated and hopeless you feel like God has abandoned you and you feel alone and sad I want you to know that God is holding you in his arms. Whoever you are listening, you are special. You are loved. He loves you so much. Whatever this problem is that you've got going on in your life or these mountains that seem too high, too big for you to defeat, God's got it. He is carrying all of your burdens, all of your problems, all of your sorrows. In fact, Jesus carried all of those things on the cross. When, remember Jesus carried that heavy cross and he was dehydrated and he'd been beaten and bruised and probably spit on and everything else. He carried all of your burdens and your problems and your sins and your shame. And he died for all of those things. He died for you so that you could be born again, so that you could be saved and have a new life in Christ. And that is just such an awesome thing. And I don't think we take enough time to think about what he really did for us. So I would just ask those of you out there who just feel burdened with shame and sorrow and sadness and think that you're not good enough, as you forgive others, have you forgiven yourself? You are a person, but there's many people out there that you don't realize that you're harboring something against yourself and you must also forgive yourself and believe that God forgives you for whatever it is that you've done that you just feel so ashamed of. God has got it. God has forgiven you. You are special. You are adored and you are loved. I'm sorry, Zev. I just felt moved to say that. I feel like there's someone or maybe there's several people or many people out there who are hurting who needed to hear that God really loves them and he's got his fingerprints all over their entire life and he's holding them in his arms. Amen. God loves us and that is so true. And that's the message. That's the gospel. That's the truth. You know, the gospel is not, not a complex message. It's a simple message, but it's a true message. But the good news is, yes, the Bible says that Amalek is coming. The Bible says that God will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. But it also says in the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verse 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, write this in the book of memorial and recite it. Then I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So on one side, he says, you're going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And on the other hand, he says, I'm going to blot out his name. What does that mean? It means that as we are walking in the sanctification process, preparing ourselves to be the victorious bride of Jesus, Yeshua, during that time, Amalek is coming. But God will enable us to overcome Amalek. But the good news is, that utterly God is going to blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven once and for all. When is he going to do that? When his feet land on the Mount of Olives and he comes back to take everything the enemy has stolen, then Amalek is going to be wiped out from heaven once and for all. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And you know, another thing for those of you out there listening to remember is that when Jesus Yeshua went to the cross, and gave up his life, 
and then rose again three days later. At the moment he took his last breath, the enemy was defeated. And so he's already defeated. God has already won. And we have to believe that. And we have to take hold of that. You know, the enemy Satan comes along and speaks lies to us all the day long, every day, and whispers things into our spiritual ears that sound like they're our own thoughts. Sometimes he whispers things or speaks things or yells things at us through the mouths of other people. Sometimes he tries to defeat us through problems and things that are going on in our lives, debts that we can't pay, marital problems, problems at work, problems with our children, you name it. The enemy really tries to get under our skin and just make us feel like giving up. And, you know, I have a a gentleman that writes to me once in a while, no matter what I do, I can't get him to, I've even given him my number to call me. He sounds like he says to me that he's given up and that he doesn't hear from God and he's given up. And he sounds almost suicidal in a few of his messages to me. And I try to write him and encourage him. And he says, I've just given up. And if you're like that out there and you've just come to a place where you've given up, you know what? I think you're at the point where God has has a huge, enormous blessing for you. You're about to reach a place of victory. And if you just hold on and hold on to the truth and hold on to God's love that he has for you and just speak to the enemy in the name of Jesus, Yeshua, with God's word and stand strong you're about to uncover a great blessing and the devil knows that and he's going to try to keep knocking you down and and beating you up and you've just got to trust in God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and lean not into your own understanding depend on him and lean on him and he will come through for you just at the right time just keep holding on amen amen we know that uh so so Haman was an an Amalek so we just spoke about that but we, what, what did Amaleks believe? What did Haman believe in? They believed in chance. They believed in everything is by luck. And God says that there is no, no luck. The word coincidence is not in the Bible. But Haman, Haman cast, cast Purim, cast lots. Why did he cast lots? Because he believed that everything is by chance. And God in his word is showing not only that his fingerprints are everywhere, but he's showing that nothing is by chance, but everything is ordained by God. It just so happens that a Jew becomes queen. It just so happens that Mordecai hears of a plot to kill the king, right? It just so happens. It just so happens the king can't sleep. It just so happens that he's brought a book. It just so happens that when he reads the book, it shows that that, uh, actually Mordecai saved his life. It just so happens that Haman Haman walks in and sees um, in the middle of the night and the king sees him sitting on Queen Esther's bed, all these things are not coincidence. They're God's fingerprints all over the book of Esther. And God says, okay, you're a Haggak, you're an Amalek. You think everything is by chance. I'm going to show you that everything is ordained. And in fact, in Esther chapter 5, verse 4, when Queen Esther actually goes to the king and wants to reveal the plot of Haman, it says, Esther said, if it pleases the king, may the king and Haman come this day to the banquet that I have prepared for him. And in Hebrew, it says, Yavo HaMelech VeHaman Hayom. Now, the first four letters of that in Hebrew spells Yud, He, Vav, He, Yehovah, Yahweh. So right there, when Esther is speaking to the king to invite Haman to the banquet, it's actually God's name behind the scenes. God is speaking through her. And we know what happened. Haman gets hanged on the same gallows that he prepared for Mordechai and the great Yehovah, the great Yahweh. We know that in, in English we say the great I am, but in Hebrew it says Yehovah, Yahweh, Yeh When Moses asked God, who should I say sent me? It's the same words, Yehovah, the great Yahweh. When Yeshua was walking on the lake in the Sea of Galilee and his disciples thought they saw a ghost, he said, do not be afraid. It is I, the great I am, the Yehovah. That same Yehovah is in the book of Esther. Fingerprints are all over. He's the one that ordained the banquet. He's the one that had Haman hanged 
He's the one who spoke through Moses. He's the one who spoke through Esther. And he's the one that's going to speak through you, through me, and through every single believer that makes himself available to preach the gospel of Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. Let's praise his name together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that, that is powerful. And I believe that today God is raising up Esther's and Jeremiah's and Ezekiel's and, and all sorts of people to represent the spirit of the living God in these end times. And there's no doubt in my mind that there are people out there listening that God has given you a powerful testimony and God has given you a powerful anointing to reach out to other people and to tell them about Jesus Yeshua and tell them the truth about what he has done for us and to tell them the gospel message and to win the lost at any cost. And you know, that is just so powerful. And, and these are the end times and it's time for us to be out there telling people the truth about Yeshua. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and, and tell people about Yeshua, Jesus Christ, while there's time. Because even if the Lord doesn't come back next year or year after that, we never know when it's our last moment. We're always one heartbeat away from the last. We only wake up every morning with breath in our lungs because the Lord allows us to wake up with breath in our lungs. Everything that we have, every breath that we take is allowed to us and permitted to us by God himself. So please, 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 if you don't know Yeshua, Jesus Christ as your savior, I encourage you today to go to him and to repent and ask him to be the Lord and savior of your life. Give your life to him. Tell other people about him while there is still time. Amen. Amen. That's what it's all about. And, you know, it's uh, very uh, uh, good you mentioned that, uh, Lynn, because really, I think that many times we need to realize that we're walking in the street, we're going to a bus station, we're going to a mall, wherever God has positioned us to be. That person that you see just walk by you, you may not see him again. He may not have an opportunity to hear the gospel again. If God is speaking to you to speak to that person in the gifting that God has given you, and he's given a gift to everyone, then go ahead and do it because you don't know when that person is going to die. You don't know when that person is going to be sick. And you don't know if you're going to ever have an opportunity to share with that person again. That's not just a person that you don't know. That could be a dentist. That could be your doctor. That could be your friend. We need to be a light to the nations and to Israel. And that's our duty. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And then he said, you are the light of the world. How are we going to be the light? We have to confess and proclaim the light that he's given us we have the holy spirit inside of us and he will enable us to speak to every person according to the situation circumstance and culture and i think that's so important that's what paul meant when he said to the jew i was a jew and to the gentile I was a gentile what he meant was that he preaches to all people but he's sensitive to the culture so we need to understand what culture we are speaking in but we need to proclaim the truth and the truth can only do one thing set you free. So it's our duty. We've been positioned here for one purpose and one purpose only, to preach the gospel, to share the message of Yeshua. He's coming back for his bride, and it's our duty to be ambassadors for the kingdom. That is so true. And you know, I just I just feel so, the devil's really hit me hard with, with guilt over the last week. Um, I live in a really good neighborhood in a good area. However, uh, right down the street from me just last week, um, it was three or four doors down. And, and I haven't lived here in this house long, just for a few months. So I don't really know the neighbors and it's been cold. So I haven't been outside to meet anybody, but I'm thinking, look what I do on YouTube, right? You know, I'm always um, telling people about repentance and about Jesus and everything like that. Well, just last week, uh, um, outside, there was an ambulance pulls up and they're carrying a dead body out of someone's house. And I find out from the little boy next door, whose mom and him walked down there, that a 34 year old man died from a heroin overdose. And again, this is like very uncommon in my neighbor in, in this particular area and neighborhood. So I never would have thought that that would happen but this person was only three or four doors down and i never thought to go to my neighbors or 
or told, told this person about Jesus. And that 34 year old man who had, uh, who had kids and a wife down there, or maybe it was his girlfriend. I don't know. They, maybe they lived together, but he didn't know about Jesus. I didn't tell him about Jesus. I didn't know them, never had been down there. But here, here I'm on the internet reaching thousands of people all the time with the message of Jesus. And here's someone three or four doors down from me that I never went to and told about Jesus, who's probably in hell right now. And, and I mean, this is a person's eternity. They're going to spend eternity in hell outside of the presence of God forever in a lake of fire. And it just would have taken me one moment to tell them about Jesus, but I didn't. And the reason I share this with everybody is, number one, I'm not a perfect person. You know, I'm no different than any of you listening. But especially with what I do, I should have thought to tell these people. So I just want to encourage you all once again, tell people about Jesus. Tell your neighbors. Tell people you come across especially if the Holy Spirit leads you to do so. It's somebody I could have gone down a witness to, and it may have been their last chance to find Jesus before they died and had to spend eternity in hell. Amen. That's what it's all about. That's what Yeshua has called us to do. No, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You're, you're working a worldly job. You're in ministry. You're a grandmother, a house mother, a, a, a student. You are first an ambassador for Yeshua, for Jesus, and whatever you do. And you need to remember that and God will enable you and God will bless you and God will put the anointing on you to do it. And that's the most important thing. Now, in the book of Esther, I mentioned that when Esther went to the king, that it was really God's name behind it, Yehovah, the great Yahweh. But you think about the banquet, right? What happened in that banquet? Haman was hanged. What's the foreshadow? It's the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 17, it says, Come assemble for the great supper of the Lord. What's that great supper of the Lord? It's the same supper of Haman being hanged. All the Hamans are going to be hanged. All the Agags, all the Amaleks are going to be hanged. So we see right there the foreshadow of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 17. We want to understand the back of the book. We need to go to the front of the book. It's all there. There's nothing new under the sun. God is speaking through the prophetic scroll of Esther. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, uh, Zev. Well, here in just our last few moments that we have left, is there anything on your heart that you would feel led to share with everybody out there listening that, that might move them or touch them or leave them feeling blessed? Uh, well, first of all, I want to get back to Haggag, the Amalek. The Bible says in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verse 7, that their king will be greater than Haggag. The kingdom will be exalted. That's speaking about Messiah Yeshua. So right there, prophesied in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verse 7, it already says that God's kingdom is better, higher, greater than the kingdom of Haggag. And from Haggag comes Amalek which is Haman. Haman the Agagite means he was an Amalek. That's what it's speaking about. So already we see the victory in the book of Numbers 24-7. We see the victory when Esther uh, invited him to the banquet, and we see the great banquet in Revelation 19-7-17, where we know that Amalek is wiped out once and for all. So all you, it's all through the Bible. That's the pattern of the Bible. War against Amalek, victory, kingdom of, of Hagag, which is the kingdom of this world, but Yeshua is the king of kings and lord of lords, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and his kingdom shall be exalted. And if you're a follower of Yeshua, it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you went through. It doesn't matter what you're going to go through. You have nitzachon. You have victory through Yeshua HaMashiach, who said it with his own mouth. I am the king of kings, and I'm coming back for my bride. It's our duty to understand that we are the bride, but we have to make it to the end. We have to run the race. This calls for patience and endurance on the faithful ones of Yeshua HaMashiach, who hold firm to the testimony of Jesus, Yeshua. And that's what it's all about. And God will enable you to do it, no matter what you're going through. Amen. And he will, and he has, but you just have to believe, and you have to just stay strong, 
until the end and it will happen god is with you god loves you just believe in him and have faith his word says that without faith it is impossible to please god so when you have faith even in your worst circumstances even when it looks like everything around you is impossible if you have that faith you are pleasing god no matter how ugly it looks no matter how horrible it feels it is pleasing to god well thank you so much zev for this powerful uh, program and everything that you've shared i am sure that it's going to bless so many people out there and you know i just everything you said was just so amazing and eye-opening and i'm just thankful for it and thankful for everyone that happens to stumble across this video and i just know that it's going to bless many people Amen. Praise God. And as the uh, Jewish people around the world are celebrating for him, the scroll of Esther, we pray that they come to know that Yeshua HaMashiach is the one who is the victorious one. And the story of Esther is just a foreshadow. So we just pray for their salvation. And we can use the story of Esther and the book of Esther to be a witness to people and to be an eye opener. And if you have not embraced Yeshua Jesus as your Messiah, as King of Kings. Now is the time to do it. Now is the time to embrace Yeshua as the Messiah. Repent and turn from your ways and understand that through him you have eternal life. Through him you have victory. And what a wonderful time to do it in this season of the Scroll of Esther where God's fingerprints are working everywhere. That's right. Now is the time. If you do not know Yeshua Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to go to him today and just pour out your heart before him. He'll listen to you. Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins and tell him that you want to make him Lord of your life. You no longer want to rule your life by yourself. You don't want to do it on your own. You want to spend the rest of your life serving him and pleasing him. And just ask, ask Jesus to come into your life and to be your Savior, and he will. He will send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to live and dwell inside of your spirit and be part of your life. Don't waste another moment. Go to him today, won't you, and ask him to be Lord and Savior of your life. Well, thank you, Zev. And for those of you listening, I didn't give it out in the beginning and I meant to. However, when I go through and turn this into a video, I will make sure I put it on the screen. It will also be in the video description beneath the video. And that is uh, Messianic Rabbi Zev's website. And it is Messiah of Israel Ministries.org. Again, that is Messiah of Israel Ministries.org. And I encourage all of you out there to share his website with other people, share this video. But he has some amazing testimonies, his own personal testimony, which we've discussed here on my YouTube channel as well. Um, just amazing, powerful testimony that has just led so many people to Jesus, Yeshua. So be sure and check out his website. And if you feel led to give to his ministry, he uses that you know, to bless other people. He is always on the streets witnessing. In fact, he's going out here in a little bit when we're finished to go witness. And he, he witnesses to, to Jewish people and wins the lost. So feel free if the Lord moves you to give Zev a gift and to bless what he is trying to do because he works so hard each and every day happily to lead people to Yeshua, Jesus. Well, thank you again, Zev. And I just appreciate you taking the time out to, to be here with me and record for the people so that they can be blessed. Well, thank you. And all praise goes to Jesus, to Yeshua. We couldn't do it without him. And again, thank you for all you're doing for the kingdom. And we're 2018. We're in a prophetic year, a year of breakthrough, a year of divine reversals, a year, the 70th year of the nation of Israel coming in. That's prophetic. And we know that God has something supernatural happening over here for the believers. Victory through Yeshua HaMashiach. The story of Esther, the scroll of Esther, is our victory. We are spiritually Israel. We win. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen and glory to God. 
Well, God bless you, Zev, and uh, I'll just be praying for you as you head out to go witness to the lost on the streets. And I just pray that the Lord is with you powerfully and mightily and um, pray that his anointing is extra strong upon you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And may Yeshua bless you.